this problem or that problem. It's just held you back and held you back and you've been restricted and you've had this obstacle and that obstacle and this problem and this report from the doctor and this from the economy and this issue in the relationship and this issue with the job. Some of you, you feel like the enemy has pulled you back and pulled you back and pulled you back and pulled you back. But you know, whenever you declare Jesus as your Lord and you transfer your trust that God, God, you take a hold of the bow. God, you take a hold of the situation. When God takes a hold of it and releases you, whoo! Being your best with Trey Johnson. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Trey Johnson and you are watching Being Your Best with Trey Johnson. You know, Heather and I are grateful for each and every one of you that tune in week after week. And maybe this is your first time to watch the TV show. You know, I wanna encourage you to get your Bible and your notepad. Today we're gonna to be talking about how to turn adversity into our advantage. You know, there's a lot of difficult things going on in our world today, and it might be in your marriage, it might be in your business, it might be financially, it might be whatever area it is. It isn't the problem that's the problem a lot of times, it's how we see the problem that's the problem. So we're gonna learn how to think different, how to believe different, how to see things from God's perspective, and how to grow during difficult times and be the best us we can be no matter what we're facing in life. So tune in, experience Expect to hear God with me, and I'll talk to you soon. Let's get right into God's Word today, and I'm really excited about uh, just what God is wanting us to get into tonight, and it's how to turn adversity into our advantage. How to turn adversity into our advantage. And you see here, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 13, 17, 18, and it says, since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke, we also believe and therefore speak. Now think about what he's saying here. Since we have the same spirit of faith, talking about how do I turn adversity into my advantage. Do you think David encountered any adversity? And he had the spirit of faith to help him overcome the adversity. Do you think Noah had any adversity to overcome? And the answer is yes. How did he overcome? With the spirit of faith. Do you think Moses had any adversity to overcome? And the answer is yes. How did he do it? He did it with the spirit of faith. See, the spirit of faith is the spirit of victory. So when we read God's word, we've got to ask, is this me? Because the spirit of faith does what? According to God's Word, the spirit of faith believes God's Word and it speaks God's Word according to what is written. Where, where do I develop the spirit of faith from? From the Word of God. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. He says, so the spirit of faith, and I want you to think, is this you? The spirit of faith believes God's Word and speaks God's Word. The spirit of faith, when it comes to my finances, the spirit of faith believes God's word and speaks God's word. When it comes to my physical body, the spirit of faith believes God's word and speaks God's word. When it comes to my relationships, the spirit of faith believes God's word and speaks God's word. Say it with me. What does the spirit of faith do? The spirit of faith believes God's word and the spirit of faith speaks God's word. So it says, we have the same spirit of faith that David and Moses and Noah and Jesus had. The same overcoming faith resides on the inside of every born-again child of God. And he goes on, this is the Apostle Paul writing this. And in verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Now think about what he's saying, our light affliction. Now when he talks about this, he's talking about the times when he was in the ship and it fell apart because of the storm and he floated into the island on a piece of the ship and he called it, my attitude, this is a light affliction. 
we're talking about a man who was beaten and left for dead three different times and he said, my attitude is this is a light affliction. We're talking about a man who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament in prison and he said, this is a light affliction. Now, how is our attitude towards what's going on in our country, what's going on in our life? If we get hung up at a red light, we throw a fit. <laughs> and Paul is saying the attitude of faith looks at problems and it has the right perspective. How is your perspective when it comes to adversity? Because how we view things affects how we do things. So through God's Word, God can help change our perspective where we see the problem correctly. And He says right here, it is working for us a far more exceeding eternal weight of glory. Do you look at a problem and you look at it as an opportunity to grow? It's working for me. When I have a, a difficulty in my body, am I using the problem as an opportunity to grow? I want you to see just like, you, you know, if you were to go to the gyms and you were to work out or something and you would use the weight, you would use the tension to help you get stronger in a certain area, a certain muscle group. Well, maybe you're, you're having an obstacle financially. Do you have the attitude that this is working for me as a weight of glory? I'm not going to bow down to the problem. I'm going to use the problem. Maybe it's a relational issue. I'm not going to back off from the situation. I'm going to press in to the Word of God. It's an eternal weight of glory. Paul says, it's working for me. Say it, it's working for me. Am I using the, the inflation? The other day I was driving down the road and, and in this part of the country I was in, you know, fuel was $7 a gallon. And, and, and on the inside, the Lord just spoke to me. He says, instead of being affected by inflation, inflate your faith. Because when we have inflated faith, we'll have inflated results. Inflate your faith. Paul says, it's working for me. You know, I, I like to work out and I've been in gyms all around the, the world. And, you know, some gyms, they are very low key. And the people that go in there, they're just happy to show up. And they're just, you know, they're not going to exert too much. You know, they're just going to walk at just the right pace. And, hey, we all got to start somewhere. And that's great. And that's fine. And, and th these places will even, you know, get upset at you if you grunt a little bit too much. Or you, mm, or, you know, you, you, you exert yourself a little bit too much. And then I've been at gyms that Arnold Schwarzenegger has started. And those people, they show up and they are intense. I mean, they have results on their mind. And it's grunting and pushing. And, I mean, they are developed and you can tell they know what they're doing and, and I've been at all different types of churches and you know some churches are like the first church not too intense I'm going to just give a little fluff and I'm just going to make yourself feel better as you go through church on the way to lunch and it's okay we're saved and we sing kumbaya and we all get together and we're all going to heaven and that's great and dandy but then I've also been at churches where they are there for results and that's the kind of church that I want to be a part of. I want to be here today when we're getting into God's Word. We're going to push some stuff for results. We're going to hear God's voice and we're going to apply God's Word and we're going to have an intention that I'm going to hear God's Word and I'm going to do God's Word because I'm working on something. That's what the Apostle Paul was saying. He says this, this weight, this light affliction, it's, it's, it's an eternal weight of glory. It's working for me. Do you look at this situation we're in in our country and say it's working for me? Have you made a decision? I'm not going to allow the problem uh, to back me down, but it's going to work for me. I'm not going to allow the difficulty to knock me down, but, but I'm going to come back. I'm going to get stronger, faster, quicker. It's working for me. And he goes on to say, um, while we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What are you looking at? Are you looking at the problem? Or are you looking at the answer? Are we allowing what we can see to talk us out of what we can't see in the natural yet? Because see, the promise of God is eternal. The Spirit of God is eternal. The goodness of God is eternal. Am I looking at what's going on? Am I, am I allowing the situations that we're in to be bigger than the God that I serve? Because one guy said he, he, we have about a, a half a foot, six inch God and about a two and a half foot devil. 
And that's the way most people look at the devil, that he's bigger than God, or the problem that they're bigger than God, but not in our house. Say it, not in our house. We serve a big God. We serve a, a great healing God, a providing God, a directing God, a God that is for us and not against us. So here's some things about adversity. Here's some things about bad experiences. Number one, everybody has them. How many of you have ever had a bad experience before? Every single one of us, right? And, and the way that we change our perspective of problems is by the way we think. Philippians 4, 8, Paul says, If you can find anything good and lovely and just and pure and of a good report, he says, meditate on these things. In other words, he says, find the answer in God's Word and begin to meditate. Begin to roll it over in your mind. Begin to speak it softly to yourself. That's what the word meditate means. It doesn't mean yoga pants and having your fingers and legs crossed and humming. No, no, meditate means like a, like a cow chewing the cuds, that you're going to absorb God's Word and you're going to chew it up and you're going to get something out of it and you're going you're gonna to spit it back up and then you're going to swallow it again and, and you're going to spit it back up and you're going to swallow it again. And, and every time we hear it and say it and, and look at it and listen to it, we're drawing the nutrients, the life of God, out of that Word. And the way we view things determines how we do things. And our view is determined by the way we think. So things about bad experiences, everybody has them. Now here's another question. The second thing about bad experiences, nobody likes them. Can I get a hand to anybody who likes bad experiences? Yeah, not, not any of us, right? No, nobody likes them. One guy said, I'm either up or I'm getting up. I know you're getting a lot out of the teaching, but I want to encourage you to go to the website, TreyJohnsonMinistries.com, and order your copy of this teaching today. You know, each and every one of us, it takes several times of us hearing something for it to become a revelation to us. Faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing the Word of God. You know, I know that you're sharp, I know that you're intelligent, and I know God spoke to you about a lot of different things during this teaching. But order the product. While you're there, don't forget I have several books that I've written. You can order a copy of the magazine there. You can sign up for leadership development. I do every Wednesday morning. If you can't be on, you can listen to the recording. You know, I'm an executive director for the John Maxwell organization. So I do leadership teachings all around the country. And it's something that I believe will add value to your life. If you're hungry about growth, if you're wanting to lift your thinking, lift your believing, if you're wanting to develop in your business, in your ministry, just in life as a housewife, as a husband, whatever it is, God has greater things in store for you. And it takes the right people speaking into our life to help us discover everything we're called and created to do. And while you're there, don't forget to pray about becoming a partner with the ministry. You know, Heather and I are traveling around the country. The show is going around the world. And every person that's saved, healed, deliver, you're a part of that. It takes partners just like you to get in connection with us, to believe God with us, and for us to take new territories for the kingdom of God. God, TreyJohnsonMinistries.com, and we would enjoy hearing from you. I'm either up or I'm getting up. Micah chapter 7, verse 8. He says, Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will arise. When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. I want to read it again. Do not rejoice over me, my enemy. When I fall, I will, I will arise. I want to encourage you to make a decision. I, I will arise. Whatever you're dealing, whatever you're going through, I will arise. Say that. I will arise. I, I will arise. And he says, and when I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. Not he might be a light to me. He will be a light to me. How does God become a light to me? Psalms 119 verse 30, it says, The entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. The entrance of God's Word, it gives light. Even when things seem dark, if we'll stay in God's Word, light is coming. Say it, light is coming. I remember one time I was going through a very difficult time, and the Lord showed me, you know, I, when I was 
I've been in hospitals and stuff throughout, you know, my life for different things. And there, there's an IV. And he said, Trey, you know, the IV that's plugged into your arm at, at the time, you might feel very weak. But if you keep staying connected to the IV and whatever they put in the IV, it's strength is coming. He says, if you'll stay in my word, even though it might not seem like it at the very beginning, light is coming. Strength is coming. Victory is coming. Wisdom is coming. Courage is coming. Hope is coming. But you've got to stay connected to the word. He says, when I sit in darkness, the Lord is a light to me. So how does light come? Light comes by the word. Matthew 6, it says, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. What are you looking at? Because it'll determine whether you have light or whether you have darkness. What are you looking at in your business? What are you looking at in yourself? What are you looking at in your family? What are you looking at, the doctor's report or God's report? What are you looking at, the economy or God supplies all of my needs according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus? The eye, what we look at, determines the level of light we walk in. No looky, no lighty. But when there is looking at the right thing, light comes. Say it, light comes. The Apostle Paul is praying for us, and this is a prayer I pray often. It says, Ephesians 1.18, By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light, so that you can know and understand the hope to which He has called you, and how rich is His glorious inheritance in the saints. By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light. Micah says, When I sit in darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. He will be a light to me. I might not know what to do in this situation, but God will be a light to me. I might not, not to know what to do with my family, but God will be a light to me. I not, might not know what direction to go, but God will be a light to me. Say it, God will be a light to me. So position yourself for our heart to be flooded with light by His Word, by His presence, by praise, by worship, by the right relationship. Are you positioned for His light to flood your world. You know, we don't want to be like Chippy the Parakeet. Have you ever heard the story of Chippy the Parakeet? You know, Chippy the Parakeet, he's, he is at one time, and this is what like we are a lot of times as Christians, you know, he's just chirping away and he's just swinging and chirp, 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 chirp. And his owner is on the phone and decides, I'm going to clean the, the bird cage out, you know. And so it has the vacuum cleaner and it's talking on the phone. And, you know, Chippy's in there just swinging. She's cleaning up the bird poop and the feathers and everything else that's in there. And all of a sudden she turned and... She realized she sucked Chippy up, and so she, I, I gotta go. And so she hangs it up, and, and she turns off the, you know, the vacuum cleaner and unzips the bag, and there's Chippy just, I mean, he just has all this dust all over him. And so she freaks out, and she grabs Chippy, and she runs to the bathroom and turns on the freezing water, and she realizes that's not the good thing, because, you know, there's just freezing water, and Chippy's like this, so she plugs in the hair dryer, and brrr, she lights Chippy up. Bad experiences. Remember, everybody has them. Nobody likes them. And here's Chippy who was singing at one time, but because of this bad experience, now Chippy doesn't sing much anymore. <laughs> and a lot of times we can go to church and things are going good and we're so excited and so happy and in Mark chapter 4 Jesus tells us this is the parable of the sower it says there's some that receive the word and they're so joyful but then when persecution comes on account of the word on account of the word the devil wants to steal the word out of our heart and how does he do it he does it through circumstances he does it through fear through worry remember my positioning myself for light to come or for darkness to come? Am I looking at the temporary or am I looking at the eternal? Am I looking at the problem and saying it's a light affliction and this too will pass? Am I, am I operating in the spirit of faith which believes God's word and speaks God's word? Or am I just going through the motions? So everybody has bad experiences. Nobody likes them. Third thing about bad experiences, very few people turn bad experiences into good. You've heard the saying, you know, when life gives us lemon, what are we going to do? We're going to give it lemonade. But a lot of times what we do is we take a picture of the lemon. And we sit there and we think, man, that is a beautiful lemon. And we put it up on the, the shelf above the fireplace. And when anybody comes in, we point them and say, you see my lemon? I mean, I've had that. When, when did you get that lemon? About 30 years ago. I mean, isn't that beautiful lemon? <laughs> Very few people <laughs> take the lemons 
and truly make lemonade. So here's some things we can do to help our perspective when it comes to turning adversity to our advantage. Number one, realizing everything worthwhile is uphill. I learned this from one of my mentors, John Maxwell. Everything worthwhile is uphill. And when I begin to meditate on that phrase, everything, when I look up that word, it's an all-inclusive word. Everything worthwhile. Worthwhile means valuable. Worthwhile means to my benefit. Worthwhile means to my advantage. Everything worthwhile is uphill. When things are good, everything worthwhile is uphill. When, every, when things are difficult, everything worthwhile is uphill. Uphill paints a picture of you're going to have to do it on purpose. Uphill means you're going to go against the grain. Everything worthwhile is uphill. How do you look at a life of accomplishment? How do you look at a life that makes a difference? Because a lot of times people think it's going to be easy to be successful in life. And if you've been breathing longer than a day, you know everything worthwhile is uphill. So one thing I've got to ask myself is, does my discipline match my dream? Do my habits match what I say that I want. The people can say, I want to be healthy. Does your discipline match your dream? I want to be a success in this area. Does your discipline match your dream? I want this. Does your discipline match your dream? Everything worthwhile is uphill. Say it. Everything worthwhile is uphill. Everybody wants a good marriage, but am I willing to put in the work to have a good marriage? Everybody wants to increase financially, but am I willing to do what I need to do to have what I say I want to have financially? Everything worthwhile is uphill. John chapter 16, verse 33. Jesus is talking here. And he says, I've told you these things so that in me you may have perfect peace and confidence. In the world you have trials and tribulation and distress and frustration, but be of good cheer, take courage, be confident, be certain, be undaunted, for I have overcome the world and I have deprived it of power to harm you and have conquered it for you. Everything worthwhile is uphill. See, nobody starts out up here without going uphill. See, uh, what maybe you're good at some, they, you know, when I, I compete professionally at the top level, and I didn't start out that way. When I first started rodeo, and they called me track and tray. And I, I would not throw it, and I would track, and I would track, and I'd 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 track, until they finally would, would you throw your rope? But eventually I got where I could throw and catch and throw and catch and throw and able to go up the whole process to the top level. See, in, in, in speaking, sometimes people say, you know, you do a good job. I didn't start out doing a good job. You know, I cussed in one of my first service, services, you know. I was a work in progress just like you. I was trying to say ship several times, and it didn't come out as ship, you know. <laughs> Everything worthwhile is uphill. Jesus tells us again in Matthew chapter 7, verse 33, Verse, chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and spacious and broad is the way that leads away to destruction. And many are those who are entering through it, but the gate is narrow, contracted by pressure, and the way is straightened and compressed that leads away to life, and few are those who find it. That's not on your notes, but he's talking about what separates the difference between people who accomplish and people who don't is the pressure of the process. The pressure of the process separates the committed from the uncommitted. See, when you make a decision that you're going to be all that God's called and created you to be, there will be pressure. It's easy to go downhill. It's easy to act like everybody else. It's easy to think like everybody else, talk like everybody else, live like everybody else. But if I want everything that God has for me, he says, wide is the gate that leads to destruction. It's easy to go here and do this and just live life. But he says, if you're wanting to walk in all that I have for you, there's going to be some pressure. And the pressure of the process separates the committed from the uncommitted. And one thing, because people, it's easy to say we're committed here in church. It's easy to say we're committed. Oh, because see, the dream that you have, it's free. It just comes up in your heart. God gives you that dream, but the price to pay for the dream is not free. Mm -hmm. 
everything worthwhile is uphill. Second thing, there's always an answer. Second perspective is there's always an answer. See, there's a difference between the way successful people think and unsuccessful people. Successful people realize there's always a solution. Unsuccessful people think there's no solution. There's no way out. There's always a solution. Say it, there's always a solution. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, it says, For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. All the promises of God in Him are yes. They're yes. They're yes. God is not up there like we used to do when we were little kids on the playground, and we have a flyer, and click, oh, she loves me, she loves me not, she loves me, she loves me not. And we take that mentality over into the church, and we're thinking God's up there saying, okay, well, maybe for him, and oh, no, Pastor Jeff, I mean, definitely not, but oh, yeah, Heather, oh, yeah. No, no. All the promises of God in Him are yes and amen to the glory of God through us. All the promises of God in Him are yes. Not maybe, yes. Yes, I was going through a very difficult time in my life and I was living in a friend of mine's barn and trying to rebuild my life and everything. And, and, and the Lord just impressed me to go rent this movie that I would never have, just because of the name. I don't remember the name of it, but I remember thinking, man, I don't, I would never watch that movie, but I just felt led to watch the show. So I, I watched the show, and in the show, this guy's saying no about everything. You know, he's some big wig at this deal, and no, can we go on vacation? His answer is no, you know. And there's several of you watching right now that you hear that knocking right inside here, and it matters whether you open the door or not, because God is not going to huff and puff and blow your door down. <laughs> He will sit there and he will stay on the outside and it's up to you to open the door and let him come in. He says, if you'll open the door, he'll come in. How, how do you open the door? How do you ask him and how do you settle where you're going to spend eternity? It's very simple. The Bible says that when a person receives Jesus, they receive eternal life. The person who doesn't receive Jesus, they don't have eternity with God. You're either going to go to heaven or you're going to go to hell. John 14, 6, Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. Have you made Jesus Christ your Lord and personal Savior? In Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, it says, When a person believes in their heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and declares with their mouth that Jesus is their Lord, it says at that time that person receives eternal life and that person settles that they're going to spend eternity with God. Would you do that with me right now? With heads bowed, eyes closed, no matter where you're at or what's going on, I want you just to repeat this with me. Just say, Father God, today is the day that I make the decision to believe in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and I declare with my mouth and I ask you Jesus to come into my heart to be my Lord to be my Savior and according to God's Word I'm forgiven I'm cleansed and I can be certain that I'll spend eternity with Almighty God